For this video, we're going to turn our attention to populations and communities and see how populations and communities interact with one another as well as the environment uh, around them. And this is for C4.1, and we'll split this into two different sections, so this will be part one. To start, we need to focus on what makes up a population. And a population is a group of individual organisms of the same species that live in the same area. Uh, populations interact by breeding, competing for food or other resources, uh, or cooperating to avoid predation. Populations can also be separated ge by geographic barriers, such as uh, water, mountain, etc. Uh, and so we can see populations uh, uh, in different locations still have the same species, they're just geographically separated from one another. And so that's what makes up a population. It's really important to be able to estimate the size of a population because the population size is the total number of individuals within it. And it's important to keep track of trends to see uh, how that population is growing or, or shrinking, uh, the health of the population, etc. It's usually not possible to count every individual within the population. Uh, camouflage within some species, uh, some, sometimes species are, are mobile, they'll move, uh, the sheer number of them. Um, and so it, it can be extremely difficult to try to count every single individual within that population. Uh, and so we must estimate the population size based off of data and evidence to be able to come up with an estimation of that overall population size. And that size is then based off of population sampling in which a small subset of the population will be sampled. And it's best to use multiple samples or multiple multiple times of sampling, multiple trials in order to develop or identify this overall estimated population size. Um, random sampling ensures that all of the individuals have an equal chance within the population of being selected. Uh, and so random sampling is used and it must exclude unconscious bias, meaning uh, something like using a random number generator to help ensure that it's completely random in the sampling. In order to ensure that uh, there is no sampling error, which is the difference between a sample statistic and a value for the whole population. For the population size, the difference between the estimated and the true size is representing the sampling error. And so ideally that will be as small as possible uh, in order to have our estimated population size be representative of the actual population size. And so one method that we can use to do random sam population sampling is using quadrats. Uh, quadrat sampling is a simple sample uh, areas that are usually defined uh, within a, a particular quadrat. Um, for example, like a one meter by one meter frame uh, that's placed in a random location or a position within a habitat to be able to record the number of organisms that are present or not present. Uh, this only works for organisms that are non-mobile, sessile organisms uh, like plants or barnacles. Uh, it doesn't work for organisms that move around that are mobile because they move uh, and they may not stay in that one particular spot. And so the procedure for this uh, would be the identification of a particular sampling area and boundary using a tape measure or some sort of measuring device, uh, the generation of random numbers to identify the distance along the tape measure for sampling, and then generation of a second random number to identify the right angle distance. distance. So you have like a horizontal and a vertical, an X and a Y axis. And then the quadrat is placed, this defined area that you're sampling, maybe like a one meter by one meter, is placed at those distances and um, uh, then used to be able to assess what species are present or, or whatever you're counting is present. Uh, and if then you would want to do multiple different locations within that sampling area uh, using those random number generators to identify specific different randomly generated quadrats to be able to sample. That random quadrat sampling works great for sessile organisms, ones that are not moving around. But for those that are mobile, it, it uh, provides a little bit more uh, challenging situation. And the best method for uh, sampling mobile organisms would be the capture, mark, and release and recapture procedure. And the use of the Lincoln Index works well for these mobile organisms. And so how this works is uh, you would capture as many individuals within a, an area as possible, and you would mark each individual without making the, the mark visible to predators so it couldn't decrease their chance of survival or impact their ability to be, reproduce, to find mates. Release those marked individuals back out into the wild, and then at a later point, recapture as many individuals as possible and count the number that are marked and unmarked. And then the calculated estimated population size uh, uses this equation called the Lincoln Index, which then um, provides a, an estimation of the overall population size based off of the number of originally marked 
individuals and then those that are recaptured that are marked and unmarked. There's a few assumptions with this process. One, that there's no migration into or out of the population. That there's no deaths or births. Uh, so the timing of, of when the initial and the second uh, population sampling takes place would be important. The marked individuals have an equal chance of being recaptured uh, and the marks remain visible. They don't disappear or go away and the marks do not increase the, the predation or the survival threats as previously mentioned. And so this capture mark release and use of the Lincoln Index works well for organisms that can move around that are mobile. Within the ecosystem, there is a finite amount of resources available for populations uh, and for different populations to be able to take advantage of and to use to be able to survive and reproduce and grow in population size. Uh, and individuals use those resources from the environment. Larger populations are going to use more resources just simply because there's more individuals. And the resources vary in their availability, but at some point they're all limited uh, at some level. And the scarcity of resources then results in competition in which some individuals will have a better chance uh, to be able to obtain those resources just due to variation within the population and some won't uh, or will have less of an ability to acquire those resources and thus a less chance of survival. And so the carrying capacity of a population is the maximum size uh, of the population that the environment can support based off of the resources that are available. And it's generally uh, will be one or two limiting factors uh, that define the carrying capacity for a population. Uh, for plants, it's typically water, light, and soil nutrition, uh, specifically nit nitrogen. Uh, for animals, water, space for breeding, food, and potentially dissolved oxygen, depending on the type of ecosystem and the type of organism that we're speaking about. And so that carrying capacity is the maximum size that the environment can uh, uh, support. Obviously, organisms are not aware of this, uh, and so the population will grow and drop depending on resource availability. And sometimes the population then will fluctuate around this carrying capacity um, without their knowledge, but uh, it's kind of an up-down in terms of population size as we uh, uh, eventually, the population eventually approaches the overall carrying capacity. Populations are not stagnant. They can increase or decrease over time. Sometimes the, they can increase if the population fills an unoccupied ecological niche, some job within the environment, and so they can exploit those new resources and increase in size. Uh, so, so populations generally fluctuate in terms of the size, but they, while they fluctuate, they do remain overall pretty stable um, due to negative feedback and because of this carrying capacity idea. And so there's different factors that can impact the population size. Density in independent factors are uh, factors that affect the population regardless of the population size. So for example, flooding, fires, natural disasters, those would all be uh, occurrences that would impact the population size that have no bearing on the density or the, the size of the population. Density dependent factors, on the other hand, do increase uh, or become more prominent as the population becomes larger. Um, reduced uh, populations and, and um, they reduce larger populations and they allow smaller populations to be able to increase. So competition would be a good example as that population size gets larger, there's more and more competition for the same amount of limited resources. Predation becomes more intense. Uh, predation, if, if there's a more dense population, it's easier to find those individuals uh, within the population. Uh, disease is also uh, increases as the population size increases. Uh, parasites, parasitism, parotis and prey infestation. All of those also increase as the population size gets larger. There's two main ways that we see populations uh, increase in size and grow. And the first is referred to as exponential growth. And this would take place when there's a period of ample resources, the population grows exponentially because there's lots and lots of resources. It's an example of a positive feedback loop that we see within biology because as more individuals are born, uh, it increases uh, the number in the second generation and then they have uh, more offspring. And so it just compounds on itself and it results in a larger and a larger population size. When we graph the, pop, the change in the population size over time, so if we measure the population size over a period of time, it, the, the graph kind of looks like a J as we can see in the image here. Uh, so it's referred to as a J curve. 
uh, and it represents exponential growth. This is not a sustainable growth uh, because generally it's only observed when a species spreads into a new area or they take over a new ecological niche that hadn't previously been occupied. Uh, and it's, it's a temporary stage of growth in which the resources are plentiful. Eventually, it's, the resources are going to run out. So it's not a sustainable growth method. Uh, and unfortunately, a good example of this is seen with invasive lionfish uh, within the Atlantic and the Caribbean. Lionfish are typically, their, their natural habitat is in the Red Sea. And they were uh, begun to be discovered um, in the early 2000s-ish. How did they get to this area if they're not naturally from here? Probably somebody released one or multiple uh, from fish tanks. So they were tired of having the lionfish, so let them out into the ocean. Uh, and so then the number of lionfish really began to, um, the sightings began to increase uh, because they have no natural predators. There's nothing that naturally consumes them, eats them. And the lionfish uh, gobbled up the fish eggs, uh, small fish within the area. And so they have, a, have, have had an exponential uh, growth in their population size. And by 2009, they were really well established along the Atlantic coast and throughout the Caribbean. Uh, so this would represent an example of exponential growth. The second form of population Population growth is referred to as logistical growth and this is where the population growth eventually declines and levels out around that carrying capacity because resources are not unlimited there's a limited amount of those resources uh, and this would be a result of density dependent factors and so the graph that we see with this kind of looks like an S so it's called an S curved and it's uh, shaped like the Greek letter Sigma uh, and it demonstrates a plateau of the population growth approximately at the carrying capacity. As we talked about previously, the population size can kind of fluctuate around that carrying capacity, but typically it stays within that area until there's some sort of change in the environment. Um, sometimes populations will incre uh, increase and then drastically drop, but eventually they kind of level out around that carrying capacity. Exponential growth curves are often depicted on a, log a logarithmic scale to prevent them from expanding too rapidly and becoming too large uh, to fit within a small uh, area on the graph. And so um, uh, that's how we oftentimes graph uh, exponential growth. In order to model the S-curve growth or the sigmoid population growth, uh, we can do so in uh, using some experiments and some organisms, uh, yeast or duckweed, both work well to be able to model this. Duckweed is a stimulus photosynthetic water plant that's found in ponds and lakes and grows on the water surface. It can reproduce asexually to increase in population size. Uh, and so some possible experiments with it could focus on uh, finding the carrying capacity of a given container, uh, different conditions of light, nutrients, um, or surface area that are ideal for that population growth. Yeast, uh, as we previously talked about um, in the course, are saprotrophic uh, fungus that lives on the surface of fruits and other locations uh, with available sugar. They can reproduce asexually by budding, and they can be used for bread making and alcohol fermentation. Both of these, if uh, the population size is tracked and they're provided sufficient resources, uh, can, can be used to be able to model uh, the population growth and establish um, by taking data over a period of time to establish an S-curve on a graph to see how that population size grows. In the second video, we'll focus more exclusively on communities, looking at how different populations interact with one another.